Well, welcome to our Calvary Baptist Church Bible Institute, and glad you can join us today. And this is the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ study, and we are in Revelation chapter number two. So I'd like for you to take the word of God and turn with me to Revelation chapter number two. Now, the last time we looked into um, just a portion, or when we began this study, we looked into just uh, pretty much um, an introduction into the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. And um, the book is just that. This is the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ. That is what the word revelation means. It means to lift the veil. And um, we saw some things about that. And then the last time, the last time, uh, we covered uh, chapter number one. And so we're in chapter number two now, and chapters two and three cover the second section in the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Uh, if you recall that there is an internal outline that the Holy Spirit has already placed in this book, and we find that in chapter one and verse number 19. Let's quickly take a look at that. Revelation chapter one, verse number 19 says, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. <clears throat> so there is that threefold outline to this book. The first part of the book is right there in verse number 19, which is chapter number 1. Write the things which thou hast seen. That is Revelation chapter number 1. And Revelation chapter number 1 uh, John sees the risen and glorified Jesus Christ. The second division in Revelation begins in chapter number two. Notice it says, and the things which are. So the things which are covers <clears throat> chapters two and three, where the Lord Jesus Christ addresses seven churches in Asia Minor. There is a letter that is sent to them. It is given to them. And he has specific things to say about each of the seven churches. So that covers chapters 2 and 3. And the third division in the book of Revelation we find is this, and the things which shall be hereafter. Okay, So that covers chapter 4 to the end of the book, chapter number 22, which is all future, which is all future. And remember that there are various interpretations or various views to the book of Revelation. There is the uh, preterist view, which states that pretty much everything has already been fulfilled and um, that that is a false interpretation to this book. Um, we hold, of course, to a futurist view, okay? meaning we're premillennial and we're pre-tribulational that the bulk of the things that we see taking place in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ is in the future. And they're going to happen, but they're in the future. I think it's pretty interesting if I were to put a prophetical timeline on the board behind me, and uh, we just kind of maybe started at with the birth of Christ. Maybe I'll do that here. We'll put a timeline on the board to try to see where we are and identify some things. But let's just put, put this right here, uh, birth of Christ, okay, birth of Christ. And um, then we'll put this, which of course is the cross, right? And uh, his death, burial, and resurrection during this time with 33 years of earthly ministry his ministry here on earth, of which the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, records for us. And you know, the thing that is amazing about the Gospels is that there is a harmony in them. Each writer, be it Matthew or Mark or Luke or John, sees the Lord in a specific way and writes specific things about them, and yet there is never a contradiction in there. There is a harmony in the Gospels. So you have the birth of Christ, and you have his 33 years of ministry on earth. And here, of course, is the cross of Calvary. Um, and then his subsequent uh, 
um, death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, and um, <clears throat> he was with his disciples for forty days, right on on earth, and then you know his bodily ascension into heaven, right? Okay, so he, at the book of Acts records that for us. And he ascended bodily in his glorified and risen body. He ascended to heaven from the Mount of Olives. And it is to that place on the Mount of Olives where Jesus will descend to at his return. And then <clears throat> 10 days later, there was the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Holy Spirit, day of Pentecost. It was at this moment where the church was empowered. Now the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry had his church, he had his followers, but it was here, it was here on the day of Pentecost that the church was empowered and they were empowered specifically for the task or the work of worldwide evangelism of which the book of Acts covers. Um, from that moment, from that moment, right here, beginning with the day of Pentecost, we are in this, the church age. We are in the age of the church. Some call it the age of grace, the age of the church. And here is where the Lord Jesus Christ, through the working of the Holy Spirit, who has empowered the church, is calling out. He is calling out those to faith in him for salvation, to make up his church. And when that last believer, when that last person receives the Lord Jesus Christ okay, during this age, then this is going to happen which we refer to as the rapture or the parousia or the great catching away. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. And the church goes to be with Jesus. Jesus comes down not to the earth at the rapture, but the church rises to meet Jesus in the air. Immediately following that, I'm putting this down here because I'm putting this down. W-O-G refers to the wrath of God. Okay? So immediately after the rapture, boom, there's a period of time, seven years of tribulation. It's important to get this prophetical timeline down because we are pre Millennial and pre-tribulational. In our understanding of future events, pre-millennial, which means the church is raptured before the millennium is established, pre-tribulation, which means the church is raptured before the tribulation begins. And during that period of time, and that's when we get into, you know, the, the things which shall be hereafter, right? Because you will notice when we, get, when we get into chapter number four in the book of Revelation, the church is not mentioned. Okay? Jesus speaks to the churches in chapters two and three. But in chapter four, all the way to chapter number 19 which is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth, and we who know him return with him, okay? the church is not mentioned. And why is that? Because the church will not go through the tribulation. We see that clearly beginning in chapter number four where John is called up to heaven. There's an open door in heaven. And John sees while he's in heaven, right? While he's in heaven, the things that will be taking place on earth, i.e. God's wrath. You see, to the church, God has not appointed us unto wrath, okay, but to receive salvation and the tribulation and everything that goes on. 
Um, when, we, when we get into this period, beginning in chapter number 6, with uh, the riding of the, riding of the, of the four horsemen and the breaking of the seals, there's a series of sevens. God uses the number seven repeatedly, perfection, right, throughout this book, such as seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls or vials. And these are, these are uh, the, the judgments of God upon this world. Each judgment gets progressively worse. During that period of time, you will see that God raises up 144,000 Jewish evangelists, um, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and they preach the gospel. And there are those who believe, but they're martyred for their faith in Christ. Later on, when we, when we get to chapters 17 and 18, and actually in part of chapter number 14, John writes extensively about mystery Babylon. And we'll see what that Babylon is. But that is, that is the revived, what we might refer to as the Roman Empire or the one world government. There is coming, there is coming a one world government. And there's no question as we look even at the signs of the times today, as, as we look at current events in this world, uh, we can see how things are, are shaping up for that to happen. There is no sovereignty among the nations. It's all open, open borders, open this and open that. And, and one day during this period of time at the three and a half year mark, that man of sin who is the Antichrist um, is, is going to, is going to um, just be very fierce uh, in his persecution towards the Jews and the establishment of a one world government along with a one world religion. So Revelation 17 and 18 okay, are, are extremely important chapters. Read those chapters together. And you will see that there are two beasts. And the beast that comes out of the sea, which means the sea of humanity, being the Antichrist. And the, sea, and the beast who come, rises up out of the earth, who is the false prophet and so forth. And um, when we get to chapter number 19, when we get to chapter number 19, uh, that is the return of Jesus Christ. And he comes back down here to earth, right? He comes back down to earth um, in the same place, the Mount of Olives, right? Where he ascended from. He descends back to that same place, Zechariah chapter number 14. There's various things that take place, the Battle of Armageddon and, and, and so forth. And um, Satan is sealed for a thousand years, the beast and the false prophet, they're cast into the lake of fire. They're the first two to enter. Satan is sealed. He's bound for a thousand years. And now a thousand years is literal. Okay, That is the millennial reign of Christ on the earth for a thousand glorious years. Satan is loosed from his prison. At the end of that, he tries in one last desperate attempt to overthrow the Lord. He gets... He gets many to follow him, but the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 20 that fire comes down out of heaven and devours them, right? And then we come into uh, the great white throne judgment, which is for the unsaved. Believers have another judgment. That's the judgment seat of Christ. And then chapters 21 and 22, John sees a new heaven and a new earth, okay? So I put this up here to show us, you know, no man knows the day or the hour. Many have tried to speculate, and it's foolishness. No one can know that. Only God himself knows. But we know this, <clears throat> that we are in the church age. We know that, okay? Because the Holy Spirit has empowered the church. And our responsibility as Christians is to be salt and light in this present age and to preach the gospel, to win people to the Lord. But the next event... That will happen on this prophetic timeline is the rapture of the church. And so that time 
is coming. And so I trust that we're all ready for that time when the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ rise first. Now, <clears throat> chapter number two begins with the church of Ephesus. So we'll read these first seven verses here, and then we'll take a look at it in more detail. All right, let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I pray, Father, as we look into the church of Ephesus, God, help us to understand the things that you would want us to know. Uh, Lord, may thy Holy Spirit guide and lead us into all truth. And we give you the praise and glory for it. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if you would follow along, Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. We read this. <clears throat> Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. Now remember, okay, the angel is the minister or the pastor of each of these churches. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, okay? And remember that the seven stars are the seven angels, uh, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So, so the figure is this, of the Lord Jesus Christ holding each of these angels, these ministers in his hand, okay? And he's in the midst of the churches. We want the Lord to be in the midst, amen? Verse 2 says this, I know thy works. Think about that. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. That speaks volumes of his omniscience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars and hast borne and hast patience and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Remember, the candlesticks okay, are, the, are the churches. Verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds, notice the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, a reference to the deity of the Holy Spirit, saith unto the church is, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to take just a couple of moments and, and um, explain some things about the city of Ephesus. It is, it is a very interesting study <clears throat> when, when you look at um, the cities in which these churches are located. And when, when you, when you kind of understand where, and we're going to look at Ephesus, where it was located, the religion, um, how there was um, idolatry, and witchcraft and all these different things taking place in that city. It helps us to it helps to shed some light on what the church was facing at that time. So as we think about the city of Ephesus here, and remember that each of these churches are located in Asia Minor. It's kind of like a semicircle going from right to left, okay, like like that. So. Uh, Ephesus uh, was a large commercial center. It was often called the Market of Asia. The city was the capital of the Roman province of Asia during the New Testament period. And it was also the largest city in that province, meaning in population. It was politically important. It was also the ranking city in both commercial and religious interests and was easily accessed by from all major highways in the interior. 
it was said that all roads eventually led to Ephesus, just like it was said of Rome. That expression was used of the city of Rome. All roads lead to Rome. And ultimately, it was said that all roads led to Ephesus. There was a harbor there. Um, the city was ac uh, ac accessed by a Roman highway uh, and so forth, various canals. So that's a little bit of the background of the city. It was an important city, a very important city, very politically important. It was a uh, commercial center. It was often called the market of Asia, uh, the market of Asia. A little, little bit about the religion, and this is what's very important, okay? The city's chief claim of fame in this area was religion. It was the worshiper. Now, they worshiped the great goddess Diana, of which we read about in the book of Acts. Okay, Diana, um, uh, which apparently fell down from Jupiter. Okay, The temple that they had was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and was actually the second temple built there to Diana. The first one was burned to the ground on the night of the birth of Alexander the Great in 332 BC. Um, liberal contributions from all over Asia Minor were sent to rebuild it to a greater splendor than ever before. Um, it was it was pretty it was pretty decent in size. It was about uh, now this this uh, you know this idol right of Diana. It was about 45 to 50 feet high and probably about the same height, okay? So Ephesus was, this is was, was their chief fame, right? This is, the, this is where Paul preached at, okay, in Acts chapter number 19. Magic was also something that was very important to the people there. Ephesus was well known for the magical arts. In fact, Greek and Roman writers made reference to books or rolls of incantations um, and magic as Ephesian writings. During Paul's time in Ephesus, those converts to Christianity that once practiced magic brought their books and burned them publicly. We can read about that in Acts chapter number 19. The total worth of that was approximately 50,000 pieces of silver, which was a very high figure for that time. So you have you know a, a, a center that was uh, very strong politically, and it had its own spirituality um, as well. But there was Christianity because there was a church here. See, the church at Ephesus was founded by Paul and became the center of evangelization for the entire region. By the way, this was Paul's model of evangelization. Okay, When you read the book of Acts, right? when you read Acts, you will find that when Paul came into an area... He would, first of all, go to the city and win converts there. Okay? He would evangelize people there. He would win converts there. Sometimes he would preach in a synagogue. Uh, people would get saved and baptized. And then the nucleus of a church was formed. And he would train men to become the pastor or pastors, depending on how many churches were there at the time. And he did that because... He, 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 it was that local church's responsibility then to evangelize the outlying areas. So when you read Acts, you see that's something that Paul always did. So he did that here in Ephesus. The city was also the residence of the Apostle John, as well as the site of the school of Tyrannus, where Paul taught daily for two years after opposition arose which was triggered by his teaching in the Jewish synagogue during the previous three months. His teaching in the synagogue probably began in the winter of A.D. 52 or 53, which, which would have put it approximately um, 20 or so years, maybe 19 or 20 years after the ascension of Christ. Okay? Um, the time of his stay in Ephesus lasted for about three years. Um, the city was, you know, again, it was uh, extensive in its size. Probably a few hundred thousand people lived there, okay? The interesting thing about it is this, okay? 
There was a church there, and we see it. Okay, obviously, we're going to be looking at this particular, particular church. But we know that the church at Ephesus is gone, its candlestick removed, and the city along with it. The church went astray, and that's true. But we also know it had good leadership at the beginning. So whatever happened, either later the leaders led it astray, or the church refused to follow its good leaders. Again, it's very important for any local church to have strong doctrinal leaders that will follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that Paul labored there for at least three years. Timothy also labored there. And tradition has it that John himself even presided over the church sometime after his release from Patmos. But we cannot dogmatically prove that. Okay, um, So some interesting things concerning concerning the, um, the background to the city. All right, so as we look at the letter to Ephesus, you're going to notice that there's five or six traits that are common, right, to each of the seven churches. There is a commission, there is character, there is a commendation, there's also a condemnation from the Lord and then the Lord gives correction as well as a call and challenge. So these are all letter C words that we're going to use for each of the seven churches. All right, so let's take a look at this, this letter to Ephesus here. Okay, And again, um, in Paul's day, it was a powerful church. So we see its commission in verse number one. So it says, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write. So in other words, the commission, meaning the pastor and the church at Ephesus. Uh, who from and whom to, right? Who did, the, who did this letter, or shall I say, who from did this letter originate? Well, it originated from the Lord Jesus Christ, and it was given to the pastor and church at Ephesus here. We see something about its character. It says here, these things, verse 1, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. So we look at here, we see some things about the faithful works of this church. Because in verse number 2, we read this, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience okay, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil now there's one thing about the church at Ephesus is that they were standing up to the task of, of preaching doctrine and, and being right in the ministry um, this was a busy church the Lord said I know thy works so in other words this was a church that was a serving church he says, I know thy labor, okay? Uh, it means that they were laboring to the point of pain. Um, there was sacrifice that, that was involved in the work that they were doing in the ministry. The Lord said, I know thy patience, meaning their uh, endurance. And opposition is something that did not phase this church. So they were standing up to the task. And look at verse number two. Again, in verse number two, in the second part of that verse, it says, And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. <clears throat> so the church at Ephesus <clears throat> was standing up for the truth of God's word. They, they hated evil, okay? They hated moral evil. Um, it says, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. Um, they hated those who, who claimed to know Christ, who were preachers, but were never saved. Uh, they were, in a sense, putting these preachers to the test. They hated this kind of ministry or ministerial evil. Okay? Um, <clears throat> they, they were standing for sound doctrine, right? They were standing for the truth of, of God's word here. And so here's a, truth, here's a church then 
that is standing up, right, for the truth of God's word. They're, they're laboring. Um, they're holding fast, right? They're patient, and they're working for the Lord, and they've taken a right stand on God's word. And in verse number three, notice, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. So that word, the words born, patience, labored, not fainted, means that they were, they were active, okay? They wouldn't put up with evil. That's a good thing. They were not putting up with evil. Now, again, remember that there was a lot of sorcery and magic at Ephesus. This was a place where the goddess Diana was. And people there, they, they were worshiping this stone figure. It's witchcraft. It's satanic. It was Satanism is what it was. And they would not put up with this kind of, of evil that was happening all around them. You see, it does tell us here, and has found them liars. You see that expression in the bottom of verse number two, and has found them liars. So in other words, it means that they checked out false apostles and they proved them to be liars. So in other words, everything, everything passed through the lens of scripture. Now, <clears throat> there is a warning that we have in 1 John chapter number four. 1 John chapter number 4. And I'd like for you to turn there for a moment, please. 1 John chapter number 4 here, okay? So in 1 John chapter number 4, again, this is the apostle John who is writing, and he's writing by, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And notice what he says. Here's the warning. Verse 1, Beloved, notice, believe not every spirit. Notice spirit, right? But try the spirits, whether they are of God. Here's why. Because many false prophets are gone out into the world. There's a warning from the word of God. Don't believe everything that someone says. Just because, for example, in today's time, just because someone has the name of Christian to them, okay, don't believe everything. Don't take what they say at <clears throat> face value. Don't just swallow it up and take everything that they say, especially if someone, you know, you're a little bit unsure about. But try the Spirit. In other words, test it through the lens of Scripture. See what God's Word has to say. One example is this, okay? There is no apostolic succession in the church age, right? The last of the apostles was John. And when John died, the office of apostleship died with him. Okay? God gave 12 apostles okay, and the qualifications that go along with it, one of them including Paul. Okay? Paul vindicated his apostolic ministry. But there are no living apostles today. Okay? It was the apostles that wrote the New Testament. And when the last amen was penned in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, the Bible was then complete. You see, God has given us 66, 66 books and only 66 books. God is not bringing new and fresh revelation today. Okay, If someone says that, they're wrong. They're wrong. Because it is the word of God that God has given to us. Okay? We, have, we have the totality of scripture, the canon of scripture. Remember that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, not the words of men. All scripture. And we believe in verbal, verbal inspiration, okay? as well as plenary, the extent of it. All the Bible that we have here, all 66 books, are given by inspiration of God. And there are no other books, there are no other writings that God has given. Okay, he's not going to be given anything else. Um, whether it was the Apocrypha or the Book of Mormon or anything like that, those things are not of God. Or some will say today, God showed me a vision, or God gave me a sign, and so forth. You better check that out by the Bible. Okay, so... <clears throat> 
when, when John says here in 1 John, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, he, he's, he's, he's given us a warning because many, he says, um, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Look at verse 2 of this same text. Notice, hereby know ye whom? The Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Okay? All right? So Jesus Christ had a real human body. Okay? But he was also God at the same time. He took on human flesh without ever, ever ceasing to be God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. That's how serious it is. Whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. So John gives us a pretty strong warning in here to not believe every spirit which is what the church at Ephesus was commended for. You could turn back to Revelation chapter number 2. They were commended for this because they checked out false apostles and they proved them to be liars. Then in verse number 4, there was a condemnation. Let's look at, look at verse number 4 and notice the condemnation here. Nevertheless, now that's a turning point. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Here's why. Because thou hast left thy first love. Okay. It means this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was no longer in the center of the church, like we see in verse number one. Remember, he's in the midst of the candlesticks. And um, this church was working. This church was serving they were laboring to the point of exertion. Okay? Uh, they, were, they were trying these false apostles. They were doing the right things, but something happened. They left, they left the most important thing, and that was to love the Lord Jesus Christ, to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. So they were doing works either perhaps for prestige, right? Right, to make a name for themselves or, or for various other reasons or simply just to desire to help others, but they left out the Lord Jesus Christ. Or perhaps they were simply doing these things mechanically. You know what I mean by that? Okay? It means that they were doing the things. They were serving. They were laboring. Right? They were trying these false apostles but it could mean that they were just kind of going through the motions here, right? Because Jesus said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. So regardless of why they were doing these things, it was not out of a love for the Lord Jesus Christ, nor to show the love of Christ in them and through them to the world. And that's important. Look with me in Ephesians chapter number three. You see, um, we labor, and I want you to remember this, please, and, and turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 3, okay? Ephesians chapter 3. Okay, so my point is this as we look at this. Okay? We serve God. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ because of, not in order to. We serve the Lord Jesus Christ because of, not in order to. What do you mean? It means that we serve him because of what he's done for us, because of, because of who he is, because of what he means to us, because he shed his blood on the cross, because he died for our sin. We serve him because of, not in order to, not in order to, gain a name or recognition or anything like that, you see? And we serve the Lord Jesus Christ because of the great price that he paid for us on the cross of Calvary. And because we love him, okay, 
we, we want to express the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and right through a lost and dying world. This world is lost and dying. Okay? And the only hope, the only hope is salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter number three of Ephesians, and I just want to point this out to you, beginning in verse number 16, notice, notice what it says, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Okay. So the, the root and ground of what we do for the Lord Jesus is our love for him may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. So we're to, we're to serve the Lord Jesus Christ because of, right? Because of what he did for us and because of our love for him. So back in Revelation chapter number two, this is a church that was serving God, right? They were doing all of these things, but evidently they were doing it for the wrong reasons. And so there's a condemnation in verse number four, thou hast left thy first love. Now, we come to verse number five here, and there's a correction, okay? So the Lord Jesus gives a condemnation then he gives correction to the church at Ephesus. And notice what it says here. Remember, verse 5, therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. And do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent. So the Lord Jesus here in verse number five, says they need to consider four things. They need to, number one, remember. You see that there. In other words, consider where he brought them from and where they used to be with him. Okay, remember. Remember where he brought them from. Okay, you see, uh, <clears throat> souls were saved, right? He brought them from that place where they were separated from him. And when they got saved, they're now in Christ, right? They're now born again. He said, remember, okay, remember that. It's a, thrill, it's a thrilling thing to remember uh, one's conversion experience. It, it really is. Then he says to repent. And repent means to get right with God, right? To repent. To repent means to, you know, it's, it's a change of mind about a direction that I'm going and it, it involves confession of sin. It involves forsaking that particular sin. That's what the Lord is saying to this church. And then he says here in verse number five here, he says, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. Okay? In other words, go back to your first love. Be motivated by that love that you had for me. Get right, repent, return, get right, be motivated by that by the love that you had for me. Because he says, <clears throat> or else, that's a powerful word. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of thy place, except thou repents, uh, except thou re, uh, repent here. So the Lord Jesus, okay, gives this um, correction. To the church here right so there's been a commission the letter is written to the pastor and and to the church at ephesus um, the character of the lord jesus christ we've seen in verse one he holds and empowers the pastors uh, christ of course must remain at the center of each church there's a commendation he commends the church but then there's that condemnation and we'll see these words repeated to each of the seven churches because they left their first love. And then he offers, he offers correction here. Now, notice in verse number six, 
God adds one more commendation to the church at Ephesus. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Okay, look at what it says here. Verse 6. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitan heresy. This was a heresy, okay, that was, that was prevalent at the time here. So, so there's two possible thoughts as to what this heresy was. Number one, it was an extreme form of Gnosticism. Okay, an extreme form of Gnosticism. If you remember what Gnosticism was, um, the Gnostics, the word Gnostic or Gnosko is, is what it is in Greek, um, refers to knowledge. It means knowledge. A heresy was established from people in John's day, then later in Paul's day, in the Colossian church of which he had to deal with concerning um, Gnostics that had entered into the church. And the Gnostics, the Gnostics believed that all matter, M-A-T-T-E-R, was evil, okay? In other words, everything physical was evil in their thinking. Only that which was unseen or the spiritual was good. And so the Gnostics then could not accept that Jesus Christ was God because he had a human body. Of course, our bodies are all made up of matter, right? So, so they rejected the fact that he was God in the flesh. And they held the belief of angels because they were spiritual beings and you can't see angels to a higher honor than Jesus himself. And they actually believed that Jesus was one of many emanations sent from God down through time. Okay. It was obviously a perversion of the gospel and they would not accept that Christ himself was God come in the flesh. And that's what they taught. That's what the Gnostics taught. It's known as the Gnostic heresy. It is something that Paul dealt with greatly and extensively um, with the Colossian church. And that's why Paul's emphasis in Colossians 1.18 is that in all things, Christ is to have the preeminence, right? So that's what the Gnostics taught. So whatever the um, actual deeds of the Nicolaitans were, there's one of two theories. Either there was this Gnostic heresy or the second theory is that this Nicolaitan or Nicolaitan uh, heresy was a type of clergy laity dichotomy, okay? Um, meaning that the clergy was separated from the laity. Well, there's no such thing, okay? We are a priesthood of believers. We are a priesthood of believers. Yes, God has established leadership in the church, but all, all of us who know Christ we are a priesthood of believers. And so what they did was they elevated the clergy. The clergy was, was up here, right? And the laity, meaning the common people, right, were way down here. Uh, and that perhaps God only spoke um, to the clergy. And the clergy then would speak to the people as to what God said to him. Well, that's false, of course. Each of us who knows Christ has direct access to God. Um, so we, we come to God the same way and so forth. Um, and this, this word Nicolaitans means a follower of Nicholas, a leader of a heretical sect of that time. Now, if we take the word Nicholas, we get the word Nico, which means to conquer. Okay, it means to conquer. In other words, it meant to conquer the people. Now, history shows us History shows us the clergy, particularly, um, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, in the Middle Age period, okay, um, through, through the means of Roman Catholicism, they were all about conquering the people. They, they were, okay? It was a very brutal time for, for people to be uh, Christians at that time. 
So anyway, this particular, um, the deeds of the Nicolaitans, a Gnostic heresy, or a means to conquer the people, um, whatever it was, whatever it was, the, the church hated their deeds as, as the Lord Jesus did. So he commends them. He commends them there. And uh, Christ said, I also hate this, uh, this heresy here. So he commends them one more time. And then there is both now in verse number seven, both a call and a challenge. So look at verse number seven. The call is this. He that hath an ear, let him hear. You see that? So in other words, the call is to anyone who will listen to what Jesus has to say. He that hath an ear, let him hear what? What the Spirit saith unto the churches. Okay? Um, God, of course, speaks to us okay, through his word. So we want to hear what God by his Spirit says to us from the word of God. Then he gives us a challenge right there in verse number seven. Notice the second part of verse seven says this, to him that what? To him that overcometh. I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. That tree of life that we find in Revelation chapter number 22 and verse two is a, is a, a, a you know, it's symbolic of everlasting life. It yields its, it yields its fruit um, year round and, and so forth. And um, so the Lord Jesus Christ issues this challenge, right, in verse number one. And notice that word overcometh, overcometh. That's a great word. First John chapter five, verses four and five says, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the son of God. So that concludes the letter to the church at Ephesus. And Lord willing, the next time uh, we'll look at the um, letter to the church at Smyrna.